Welcome to Chicago, 1920 style. It was the wildest town in America, a Dodge City set to jazz. And sometimes you needed a program to tell the gangsters from the lawmen. This then was the Chicago of one of the most fascinating and frightening eras in history. A time when people lived as if there was no tomorrow. And sometimes there wasn't. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. And we used to say you can get further with a kind word and a gun than you can with just a kind word. There was to begin with his enormous vanity. He loved publicity. He welcomed newspaper men. He gave interviews of all kinds. He was a little strutting Napoleon rooster of a man. The idea of a public enemy certainly is part of a mythological understanding of society as a tension between good and bad. In that sense, a public enemy like an Al Capone simply is a dramatization out of public ideas, the public fantasies of evil. Capone was born in, in, in Brooklyn, not in Naples, as is sometimes in Rubin. He was extremely proud of being an American, not like many of his uh, fellow uh, Italians. He, uh, he, in fact, he would say, I'm not an Italian, I'm an American. Al Capone grew up with eight brothers and sisters in a teeming neighborhood where organ grinders and opera singers filled the air with music. Life on the street was much more accommodating than a crowded cold water flat. Capone's father, Gabriel, who had little influence on his son, eked out a living as a barber, while his mother, Teresa, worked as a seamstress. The Capones emigrated from the slums of Naples to the slums of Brooklyn in 1893. Poor, unskilled, illiterate, they landed on Ellis Island during the largest immigrant wave in American history. They changed their name from Capone to Capone, but still faced prejudice. At this time, Italians were at the bottom of the heap in the pecking order of new arrivals to the promised land. The Capone's fourth son, Alphonse, was born on January the 17th, 1899. These kids were born and, and, and bred in uh, the lowest range of poverty and misery. And uh, they had really no place to go. Few of them bothered to uh, stay in school very long. Capone only got as far as the sixth grade. Unfortunately, neither the schools uh, nor the church succeeded in handling these boys. The stage was set for a classic first-generation upbringing in America's urban jungle. It was in the streets and in street gangs that the alienated offspring of New York's immigrant families obtained their real education. Taking to the streets, the young Capone acquired a reputation as sullen, troublesome and tough, with a murderous temper. He was ripe for the tribal society and criminal culture of the Five Pointers, one of the many gangs that staked out territory in the neighborhoods of New York. The gangs, the violence, the robberies, the beatings, and so on, 
the gangsterism itself was a relief. It was something for them to do. It gave them a sense of being. Now, I don't mean to suggest by that that every, every little boy, poor boy who was brought in that neighborhood, was a uh, instinctive criminal. Not at all. This was a comparative minority. But those who did, did come from these impoverished, stifling, environments and this was something exciting to do. Capone was 16 years old when through his contacts in the gang he landed a job as a bouncer in a saloon. It was here during one of the innumerable brawls that marked his early career that Al ran into the wrong end of a concealed weapon one night. The cut was serious enough to require medical attention. but it was the wound to his vanity that endured. Capone disliked it when photographers caught his bad side, and to conceal his four-inch scar, he resorted to makeup and tall tales. The news has got a best story. Pictures of you, one of me, too. <laughs> Where'd they run it, in the razor ad? Huh? Oh, that? That's an old business. You get used to that. I got it in a war. War, with a blonde and a Brooklyn speakeasy. <laughs> Johnny Torrio, former head of the Five Pointers, was a mild-mannered underworld figure who took a liking to the brash young Capone. When Torrio invited Capone to join him in a new venture in Chicago, Al jumped at the chance to avoid homicide charges at home. The only completely corrupt city in America is how one crime commission characterized the Chicago of the early 20th century. It was the place of a thousand brothels, where politicians, judges, and cops were all on the take. Chicago was custom-made for the predatory new class of criminal Al Capone epitomized. No pleasure dome in America captured the excesses of the Roaring Twenties better than Colosimo's Cafe on South Wabash Avenue. A nightclub with a top-notch orchestra and first-class restaurant, it was run by Johnny's uncle, Big Jim Colosimo, the foremost Chicago racketeer of the age, as a front for his white slavery and prostitution operations. The cafe enjoyed such legitimate renown, it was frequented night after night by the rich and the famous. Behind the scenes, Torrio, an organizational genius, was soon supervising all of Colosimo's operations. Capone's initial duties, however, were varied and humble, from bodyguard to chauffeur to bartender. Colosimo's had the prettiest chorus girls, the most talented musicians, and the best wine list in town, until an unexpected passion eroded the profit margin. Big Jim's undoing was his infatuation with a young singer named Dale Winter. After divorcing his wife to marry her, Colosimo began to neglect both the legal and illegal sides of business. Torrio cast aside family loyalties and had Capone deal with his uncle in decisive fashion. Big Jim was the first of Chicago's great crime bosses to be assassinated. His lavish send-off became the model for all gangster funerals to come. Among the showiest floral tributes on his bronze casket were wreaths from Johnny and from Al. One honor eluded Big Jim, though. He was denied burial in a consecrated grave, not because he was a criminal, but because he was divorced. Now Torrio established himself as a major force in Chicago's gangs, controlling the rackets and brothels on the west side. And he made Capone, whose violent nature was so unlike his own, his junior partner. Now listen, you. You let me think up the ideas. I'll take care of that big hop in my own way when the time comes. I say we stay out of the north side. I say we leave O'Hara alone, and what I say goes. Don't ever forget that. You're the boss. That's better. From now on, next to me, the boys take orders from you. Yeah, me and you, eh? That's fine talk, boy. Thanks largely to the Women's Christian Temperance Union, a new outlet for crime promising a bonanza in profits came into being on January the 17th, 1920. On this date, Al Capone's 21st birthday, the National Prohibition Act was passed into law. 
this was the great triumph of what the WCTU had accomplished, what the women of America had accomplished. They were tired of having their husbands come back on Saturday night without a cent and beating them up. And the WCTU became a powerful political force, in fact, so powerful that it was one of the principal elements uh, in bringing about prohibition. In 1920, Prohibition arrived, and a country just recovering from the war jitters fell into a new delirium. The bootlegger sprang into being. Overnight, he switched the nation's mind from battles to bottles. An evasion of the law became the new national pastime. College students, yes, even high school kids and flappers, joined the mad party, and the jazz age was born. The nightclubs were packed with delirious, free-spending thrill hunters. Money poured into the coppers of the underworld to be fought over and stained with blood. In Chicago, illegal booze went into production fast, efficiently, and on a grand scale. Few citizens complained of thirst for long, and fewer still complained of breaking the law. You might say that the public felt that it had enough of moral leadership. It preferred a cynical, laissez-faire attitude toward morals. I think that prohibition and the public flouting of prohibition has to be understood in that context. In Chicago's Mayor William Thompson, Al Capone found his ideal civic leader, an amateur politician as inept as he was corrupt. Big Bill Thompson is, I guess, one of the crookedest mayors that any city ever had. In fact, whether Capone could have been as successful as he was without Thompson is a dubious question. When reform candidate William Deaver defeated Thompson for the mayor's job in 1923, the underworld lost an ally in City Hall. Deaver was so tough on crime that Torrio and Capone were forced to relocate. Just outside the Chicago city limits was Cicero, Cicero was no match for the modern gangster. The citizens, despite their best efforts, were powerless to prevent gang rule. Capone and Torrio bought off politicians, rigged elections, and the conquest of Cicero was accomplished. Until Capone moved his headquarters to Cicero, Cicero was a relatively law-abiding, quiet uh, suburb of Chicago. Now violent crime became commonplace, as the gangsters established gambling joints in Cicero and a string of 22 brothels in nearby towns. A new weapon called the Tommy Gun did not make the job of honest cops any easier. By terrorizing local voters, Capone made sure candidates won office who would call off the raids on his gang's roadhouses. The saying went, if you smell gunpowder, you're in Cicero. But victory came at a price. Al's brother Frank was killed by police in front of one of the polling stations where he was seen waving his gun in voters' faces. It was there, incidentally, that Capone himself was almost killed. Uh, one of the rival gangs went whizzing past a car and emptied uh, one or more machine guns into his headquarters in Cicero. One of his henchmen dragged him down onto the table, he was not touched. But it was a close call. By 1924, Torrio and Capone controlled virtually all the gambling and bootlegging in West Chicago and the western suburbs. Their roadhouses, speakeasies, and brothels brought in tens of millions of dollars a year from customers who appeared to be well satisfied with what they were getting. As Capone liked to tell the press, I give the public what the public wants. Whenever a truce managed to hold among the rival gangs, the underworld enjoyed a period of peace and prosperity. But then, a truck of liquor would be hijacked, a territorial line would be crossed, or an old feud would erupt in an ambush, and the cycle of violence and retribution would begin all over again. Capone's competitors included the six Jenner brothers in Chicago's Little Italy. Behind the facade of an olive oil importing business, the Jenners specialized in bootlegging and extortion, 
and used assassins who rubbed their bullets with garlic in the belief that it induced gangrene in their victims. Even more dangerous to Capone was the North Side Gang, whose members included Bugs Moran and two other vicious individuals. Jaime Weiss, the man who coined the ominous gangland phrase, we're taking you for a ride, and Diane O'Banion, who supplied flowers to gangster funerals when he wasn't killing or safe cracking or bootlegging. After O'Banion double-crossed Capone in a brewery deal, he was found shot in his florist shop. He was buried in style himself, with a funeral cortege a mile long and 26 limousines full of gangland figures. O'Banion's death unleashed a wave of violence so intense there was one long stretch when Chicagoans woke up to a fresh gangster fatality every morning. Johnny Torrio narrowly escaped death when he was shot in the throat by executioners sent by O'Banion's cohort, Jaime Weiss. Weiss himself was waylaid in a carefully planned assault attributed to Capone, but never proved. Torrio, after recovering from his wounds, laid in a supply of turtlenecks and decided to quit the high-risk business of crime in Chicago. He handed over to his younger partner a shaky conglomerate of breweries, gambling dens, and brothels. Before calling the empire his own, Capone had the daunting task of winning back, subduing, or destroying every major gang in the city. He would rise to the challenge. all your money. I hear you're getting a new car. Mm-hmm. Different. It's got bulletproof glass and a steel body. I got myself a new house, too. Come up sometime? Yeah, I'll bring my grandmother. Al Capone's house on South Prairie Avenue featured steel gates, put-thick concrete walls, and windows with bars set too close to admit a bomb. This was home for May Coughlin, the camera-shy Irish girl, two years Al senior, who had married him in 1918. Old-fashioned sentiments shaped Capone's views on marriage and the family, with the woman's role squarely in the home, behind her man. Capone doted on Albert Francis' Sonny Capone, their only child. Sonny's early bout with a mastoid infection left him with a hearing aid and a shy nature. And when Capone brought his mother to live with him after his father died, he had the three most important people in his personal life under one roof. As Capone's wealth and power grew, so did his celebrity, and he would bask in the attention when he went to sports events or dined out in restaurants. He won the affection of ordinary people with lavish tips and gifts. Capone was especially vulnerable at the track. He once claimed that he lost $10 million betting on the wrong horses in Chicago. Capone was also vulnerable in his sexual pursuits. As much as he worshipped his wife, he never thought twice about sleeping with the prostitutes and high society groupies of his day. It's believed a beautiful teenage Greek girl he kept as a mistress in 1928 infected him with venereal disease that would shorten his life. His fellow gangsters abhorred publicity, but Capone welcomed it and tried to turn it to his advantage. He delighted in representing himself as a legitimate businessman who was playing a constructive role in the social and economic life of the country. At one point, he was so convinced of his eminence that he invited the Rockefeller's public relations expert to work for him. But it's doubtful that even the slickest PR man could help anyone credited with causing more than 300 murders. In 1927, Capone returned to Chicago as his protege Thompson was elected to a third term as mayor. He installed himself in an impressive suite of rooms at the Lexington Hotel, convenient both to City Hall and the police station. Capone, now at the height of his power and respectability, sustained his reputation for personal violence. But I get nowhere unless 
The team wins. Team. Five of Capone's seven brothers were found jobs in his various enterprises, but the only brother to amount to much was Ralph. The first Capone boy born in America, he rose to director of liquor sales for the entire territory and earned the inevitable nickname, Bottles. Capone rewarded Frank Nitti, one of his most reliable soldiers, by making him treasurer of an increasingly disciplined criminal organization. In a somewhat pathetic way, Capone probably did have some cravings for respectability, and he did want to put himself on the same moral plane as successful American business leaders. In a way, by treating Capone as a civic leader on the same stature as a mayor or a governor or perhaps a business leader, the public was revealing its cynicism about public figures, about governors, mayors, and business leaders. There are those who would have you believe that Chicago is the crime-ridden center of our country or the world. It is untrue. Mayor Thompson launched a brief, ill-fated run for president in 1928. He made a feeble attempt to run gangsters out of town and blamed Chicago's problems on Washington. To do away with crime, do away with prohibition. Thompson's temporary crackdown on the Chicago underworld did not impress the general public. Local Chicagoans failed to see any relevance to their own lives in the activities of the gangsters. People would say, well, what difference does it make? They only kill each other. It wasn't like today where you, you may walk out into the street or in the subway and be shot dead for no reason at all. But in those days, people thought, well, they're only killing each other. It did not go around carelessly. Children. Capone's need for a sanctuary away from Chicago arose from the threat of rival gangs and the city's sporadic efforts at reform. He considered many locales before settling in Miami, but his reputation preceded him. He was rebuffed in humiliating fashion in Los Angeles, New Orleans, and other cities. Some Floridians were appalled by the gangster's arrival, but just as many would welcome the notorious figure in their midst. Through an intermediary, Capone managed to acquire a 14-room house on Palm Island in Biscayne Bay. This became Capone's second home and winter retreat in the sun. Though more than a thousand miles away from Chicago, Capone maintained his strong hold on his varied network of illegal enterprises. He presented a facade of leisure and living the high life, all the while plotting and scheming. He had the perfect alibi when all hell broke loose in Chicago in a blast of gunfire that would be heard all the way to the White House. It's all set for this Thursday, Mr. Capone, in the morning, around 10.30. We got a nice Valentine all ready to deliver. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was probably the most publicized, the most horrifying outrage that had occurred, uh, which, which, in which he himself uh, did not commit. In fact, he was far, far away on his Florida estate when uh, the crime took place. And of course, as you know, it completely missed its point. The guy he wanted to get was Bugs Mor Moran, who wasn't even there when these, uh, forget how many there were, uh, seven of them were machine guns in the garage in Chicago. With Moran now gunning for him, Capone gave himself up to the Philadelphia police on a weapons possession charge that would grant him a few months of relative security behind bars. President Hoover finally decided to intervene by dispatching the Treasury Department and in the person of Elliot Ness, the Justice Department. 1929. By law, the country was dry. Through connivance with Al Capone, Chicago was wet. Even now, while Al Capone served a short term for carrying a gun in Philadelphia, the organization functioned smoothly, helped by corrupt officials and a public 
that was indifferent. Social headquarters of the mob was the Café Momart. This night, the night of June 17, 1929, the gang was to encounter its chief adversary, a prohibition agent named Elliot Ness. The real Elliot Ness, contrary to popular belief, never met Al Capone face to face. Nor was he the one to bring Capone to justice. His special unit of hand-picked men, known for their integrity, could not be bought off in the typical Chicago style of dealing with law enforcement. They became known as the untouchables and would make an impressive impact on the Capone empire. Taking advantage of Capone's absence, Ness raided 20 of his distilleries and half a dozen of his breweries. His team destroyed millions of dollars worth of hard to replace capital equipment. Ness hit Capone where it hurt, in his wallet and his pride. Just when the St. Valentine's Day massacre left him master of the Chicago underworld. Ness even had the audacity to parade Capone's confiscated beer trucks in front of his headquarters at the Lexington Hotel. procession of Joe Fuselli passed under the windows of Al Capone's suite in the Lexington Hotel. <laughs> it is the one of our funeral. Elliot Ness Al Capone symbolism is really one of unassimilated immigrant roots and totally assimilated Americanism. Like Capone, Ness was the son of immigrant parents. The youngest of five children, he lived in a pleasant small town outside Chicago where traditional American values prevailed. It was much easier for his Norwegian father and English mother to be absorbed into American culture than it was for the Capones of Brooklyn. In this stable environment, the Nesses ran a bakery where Elliot worked after school. The young Ness enjoyed reading the adventures of Sherlock Holmes and loved sports. He became a first-rate tennis player and jiu-jitsu expert. He grew up with a sense of security and righteousness that comes from being pampered and provided for. At the University of Chicago, Ness studied commerce, law, and political science, then did a year's graduate work in criminology. In 1927, he joined the Justice Department and found himself fighting an evil power undreamt of in the safe and sane suburbia of his youth. It was in October 1929, with the crash of the stock market, that times changed for Ness, Capone, and America. With US securities losing $26 billion in value in a single day, a decade of unchecked free enterprise and self-indulgence came to a screeching halt. The Great Depression changed opinions of the freewheeling gangsters and hoods who drove big cars, wore fancy suits, and smoked expensive cigars. Unemployment, hunger, and homelessness combined to lend even greater urgency to government efforts to stop Capone by any legal means. Ironically, Capone, the self-styled philanthropist, acted more swiftly than the government to ease suffering in Chicago, the city hardest hit by the collapse of the economy. He distributed thousands of food packages to needy families and financed a soup kitchen that fed 3,000 unemployed men daily. On Thanksgiving, Capone donated 5,000 turkeys. At Christmas, he gave a mammoth party for the poor. And naturally, he milked the program for all the publicity that it was worth. On a Sunday, a cold day, it was very hot when these poor men here. I enjoyed myself. I right, sure, all these poor guys here are just naturally hungry and starved now. Look, look what Capone is doing for these poor guys. He's doing all this himself. Now, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, 
Finally got a work friend and gets us here to work. We'll go wide to work. And wasn't for our friend Al Capone, old, roping up in this here White House on 935 South State Street, we wouldn't need. In the summer of 1930, another event forced the public to take a harder look at Capone. A crime reporter named Jake Lingle was assassinated on his way from his office at the Chicago Tribune, the city's 11th gangland murder in 10 days. The idea of a journalist being hit created an outrage, even though Jake was a compulsive gambler and a longtime crony of Capone, capable of shady behavior himself. Lingle was buried with all the extravagance of the many gangster funerals he himself reported on over the years. There were rumors that Capone ordered the hit because Jake had cheated him in a financial matter, or that he knew too many secrets and had got too close to Capone. Al denied all, but his imperious figure cast an unwelcome shadow on the funeral procession. Frank Wilson now appeared on the scene. He led US Treasury staff in an investigation of Capone's income tax history. At the same time, Ness probed the violations of prohibition. In a case of unprecedented scope, Treasury agents combed through mountains of papers seized by police in raids on various Capone establishments as far back as 1924. It was Wilson's accidental discovery of three black ledgers from these early years that pinned down substantial net profits never reported as revenue by Capone. The tax evasion case against Capone went to trial on October the 6th, 1931. Al Capone, commissar of vice and corruption, became a front page figure and a millionaire on the easy money involved in evading the noxious law. Capone really had a hell of a nerve. In court, he didn't hesitate to bawl out his own lawyers. He was outraged at the idea that they would actually think of putting Capone in jail. To the average American, the trial of America's most famous gangster for 22 highly technical tax counts seemed like a bizarre way to pursue a man linked with much more serious crimes, such as murder. But as far as the jury was concerned, the government's case worked. October the 24th, the man who considered himself out of reach of the law, untouchable in his own way, received the stiffest sentence ever handed down in a tax evasion case up to that time. Al Capone's train is arriving from Chicago, and the crowd is rushing to get a glimpse of the ex-big shot. A sedan is waiting to take him to prison, and here he is still sporting his big white hat, which will probably be all out of style when he gets a chance to wear it again. That's the end of Mr. Capone and his last glimpse of the outside world for many a day to come. This is the Atlanta Penitentiary, where Al is doing his stretch as convict number 40,886. Al may be put in the laundry or the shoe factory. It's too bad they haven't got a brewery. He'd be an expert at that. They say his favorite tune is, I wish I was in Dixie. Well, he got his wish. The public saw Al Capone as a person whose criminal empire was based on prostitution, loan sharking, labor racketeering, bootlegging. It wanted a prosecution for exactly those offenses. It didn't want him to be prosecuted for technicalities. Soon after his imprisonment, Capone made headlines once again in connection with the kidnapping of Charles and Ann Lindbergh's 20-month-old son, irreverently referred to as the greatest news story since the resurrection. It was a case that captivated America. Months passed, and people grew frustrated, as the government seemed incapable of solving this crime. From his jail cell, Capone got word out that if he were released, he could get the aviation hero's baby back. 
He even offered to have his brother Ralph take his place in prison to guarantee his return. The irony of this bid for freedom was that the kidnapping, like Capone's entire career in Chicago, was not seen as an isolated crime. The American public saw instead the triumph of an all-powerful underworld over an impotent government. In 1934, Al Capone was moved from Atlanta to Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay, a new prison where he would stay until 1939. The transfer was a calculated effort by the federal government to reassure the public it now had super prisons to handle the super criminals who had menaced American society for so long. As the toughest American jail ever built, Alcatraz symbolized the government's swing from bemused tolerance of gangsters to aggressive prosecution and containment. Alcatraz was a nightmare even for hardened convicts, whose keepers had license to beat and straitjacket any prisoner who got out of line. It was here Capone felt the full effects of his long festering syphilis condition. Shock treatments and arsenic injections slowed down but could not stop the ailment as it attacked Capone's brain and sapped his strength. Released early from Alcatraz, as his health deteriorated, Capone spent his last seven years on Palm Island, a harmless, grossly overweight recluse haunted by imaginary killers. The wedding of his beloved Sonny was a bright spot, but Capone's mind and motor skills declined rapidly. By the end, he mumbled without making sense and walked like a robot. And whenever a car passed with men in it, the once fearless five-pointer of Brooklyn flew into a panic. In the midst of a period, a faint echo from the past was heard. A mumbling, half-crazed man was released from prison, only to die of an incurable disease that had ravaged his brain. Scarface Al Capone was laid to rest in his native Chicago. Capone died on January the 25th, 1947, shortly after his 48th birthday. When Capone fell ill with syphilis, Elliot Ness, in a strange twist of fate, was in Washington, producing wartime propaganda films warning against venereal disease. If the road they travel to your town leads to prostitution, law evading saloons, gambling and low amusements, the nation and the community will suffer. But when a community stamps out these unwholesome conditions and provides decency and order, friendly churches, clean sports, good food and rest, adequate health and medical care, that community is truly aiding national defense and American welfare. Syphilis and gonorrhea are old and persistent enemies. We must fight them today. In 1947, the year Capone died, Ness ran as the Republican candidate for mayor of Cleveland. But on the campaign trail, his lifelong distaste for politics was obvious to his voters, and he was resoundingly defeated in the election. The race for mayor left Ness in debt and a series of business setbacks made his finances worse. His second wife, Eveline, divorced him because of his prodigal lifestyle. He married Elizabeth Anderson Seaver and moved to New York where the couple adopted a son. In 1955, Ness sat down to record his exploits in Chicago. The book was a success, but fame still eluded Ness. Before it reached the shops, he died of a heart attack at the age of 54. It was in Robert Stack's performance as an untouchable on television that Ness would achieve a degree of immortality. And they were like vigilantes, and uh, they did the thing they did out of anger. Uh, Ness did that because somebody called him a wimp who was a prohibition officer, and he wasn't doing anything about the, the, the crooks and got seven guys together and took on Capone, and that's how it happened. But there were no parameters then. They made their own. 
I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. Come out here, Capone. You want to fight? You want to fight you and me right here? That's it. Come on. But we're fascinated by gangsters, basically, because they are part of our tradition, the outlaw, the American outlaw. They're the people that rise fast, have money, cars, beautiful women, and we think of them as being very colorful. And that's that's America. That's Billy the Kid. One of the most um, obvious facts about an Al Capone is the personality traits that he had are exactly what are called for for success in American business or indeed any line of work that would tolerate someone of his unrespectable, unassimilated background. One of the most fascinating aspects of any of the ethnic criminals is that they so clearly foreshadow the success that that same ethnic group is going to have in legitimate lines of work using those same ethnic character traits once the group is able to move into a position of greater respectability in American society. A Capone has risen again. Many Capones. And they're not all in prison. Some on Wall Street, some in Washington, and elsewhere.